You are my righteousness I rest in your faithfulness For the promises that you made to me You will fulfill For the promise of the Spirit I have received from you Your word is pure and power And it is tried and true Yes, I am your servant Humbly now I bow to you You are my master Creator, Redeemer Savior who loved me and does now And always will For your sacrificial death You revealed your love for me Now all my sins you hurled Into the deep blue sea Yes, I am your servant And I love just like you do By laying down my life for my brother Yes, this is what it means To love one another To take up one's own cross And die to self Yes, this is what you did Yourself Oh, you are my dear friend Your honor I'll defend For you are my Lord And you're my God Who gave me life and now I lift my voice for all the world to hear To share your love with all of those who live in fear Yes, I am your servant, I'll proclaim the world of truth By teaching you the one and the only way And you they must believe, for there will come a day when you will judge the earth with eyes of fire And crush the serpent's head, the liar Oh Lord, there is no one like you who are God's son Your death at the cross has set me free, the victory is won The day will come when you will reign upon the earth and we will sing to you who gave us the second birth Yes, I am your servant and I bow Yes, oh Lord, I bow Yes, oh Lord, I bow to worship you I worship you I worship you Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, also my translation of that particular uh, book, Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. And thank you, Cheyenne, for putting in those updated translations. Uh, tomorrow I'll have an, another one, and that should be good for another, at least another week. And we're almost done with, I'm almost done translating Daniel chapter 7. So thank you very much, much Ms. Thompson. Uh, also, Mr. Thompson back there, Tyler Thompson, is everything all right now that all the people have left the house? He was like, the, one day he was like, there are all these people in the house. There's, there's only three, two, with you, there's like seven people. It's like, are you like a little old man? It's unbelievable. I never forget that. We go to see uh, that Beatle, uh, Beatle tribute band, and we go, yeah. so what do you think of the Cheyenne? You like it? It's good. Oh, yeah, of course, I love it, you know. Titus, what do you think? Oh, it was good. And, and, and Jody, it was good. And then Tyler. It was a little loud. What? How could... He's a little old man. He's like, how old are you? 15 years old. Every 15-year-old kid I ever knew loves loud music. And that wasn't even loud in that theater. That, that's nothing. That was very good. I've been in concerts where your ears bleed and uh, really loud. But, uh, in fact, I had bands that could be really loud. But anyways, uh, I have to tell this story for our internet people and uh, pal talk. Titus and I go golf, and he doesn't care. This is a good story. He, he likes this one. So we go golfing. This is only, mind you, the only second time out that Titus has gone golfing. So in his grace and his mercy and his love for his brother in Christ and his pastor, to keep me company, he, goes, he takes up golf. Now, so he, he was, he, he, we've hit some golf balls at the driving range. We went out one other time last year, right? No, no, we've gone out two other times. I think we went over, to, uh, over here across the way. So he's at, this will be the third time yesterday we go out. So we're playing, you know, and he gets, after a while, you know, he starts hitting the ball 
pretty good. I mean, we get to the 18th hole, and it's a tough hole. It's like, you know, it's, it's 400 and something, 50 yards, whatever. But there's like a little cr creek in front of the green, and the green's really small, and it's up. It's like a rounded off. It's like on a plateau. It's like it, the, you better hit it onto the thing, and it stays there. Otherwise, it's going to roll off. So there's water in front of it, and you, gotta, you kind of have to lay up, hit the drive. You have a good drive. You still have to lay up unless you can hit an absolutely perfect, you know, uh, uh, eight or nine iron onto the green and have it stick there, have it hold, which is tough to do. And there's, you know, it's little trees around the thing and everything. So I tell him to lay up. He does, ex he hits a, well, first of all, I hit a great drive. I, and he comes right, and he's, he hits a great drive. He's really starting to hit the ball really good. I was like, man, he, he's starting to hit the ball good. Then I go to him and say, okay, I want you, you got to lay up, you know. So he lays up, he hits the shot exactly where I want it, way exactly where you should hit it. So then I go, well, you know, I'm gonna see if I can get stick this on the green. I, I take out a, I think I took out a nine iron or a pitching wedge, and I I hit it all right, but I hit it fat and it, and it went in the river. So I'm now I'm you know like oh great. So then he uh, he gets up there and and uh, he uh, he goes. Um, so he hits the first one, and he hits the one in the river. I said, get, hit another ball. Just get, you know, just get, just have, we're having fun, get, you know, get practice. So he goes up and he hits another ball. And my back was turned. I'm busy trying to go look for my ball. So he's hoping it went, didn't go in the water. So he, he hits his ball, and then he doesn't do anything. He doesn't say anything. And he's like, <laughs> so he must have really poor eyesight or something. So he, so he, you do, you need to get your eyes checked. So I go, I'm, I'm looking in the, I'm looking in the whole thing, hoping my, my ball is stuck on the, gra in the grass just before it goes into the water. It's, hopefully it just stuck there, but it didn't. So I go, I, I drop a ball, and I hit it onto the green. And it goes, it roll, of course, it rolls off the back side. I thought I had it. I was right at the thing. So I'm back there looking around. He said, where'd you hit your ball? I figured, he said, ah, it's somewhere in the back there or something. And I was like, so I'm looking around. He said, Tess, I don't see it at all. So we go up to, you know, so I chip my ball on the green, and then I'm, I'm going to pull the pin out because I'm going to go putt, and he's still looking for his ball. <laughs> so I look in the thing and says, your ball's in here, you <laughs> It's in here. How'd you, hit the, how'd you do that? And then he's going, it went straight in the air. It, didn't hit, it must have hit the pin. He goes, no, it went straight in. Then, then what are you telling me? Why'd you go up to the pin if it was went straight in, if you knew that? It's like, or it looked like that. It was an optical illusion, I think he told me. So he wasn't sure if it went in, so he disappeared, so... Anyways, unbelievable shot. That's a great shot from where he hit it. And I was like, and to go, bam, into the ear and, and go in the hole. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I, I didn't even get to see it. So we had a good time. Smoked a couple of cigars. And then uh, we, had, we had a good time. That was a lot of fun. So I think, he, I think you enjoyed it. I think it was pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty good. So golf's, that, not, golf's a pretty good sport. I like it. And I uh, wish I could play better. But anyways, uh, all right. Well, uh, we have 90. 90. I had my, my uh, phone said uh, my... Uh, 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 Weather Channel app said uh, my uh, my iPhone said it was 93 at one point today. So I stuck the ear on. I was like, talk about extreme. We had the cold, rainy spring all the way up to last week, and now well, we were in the 40s last week, 35, and then it uh, now we got 90s today. So I think it's I think the good weather is here to stay. It looks like it's going to be not as hot as it was today, but so anyways, that's good. I like sitting out on my porch at, after I teach and and. Uh, it's it's nice it's nice and you can see they've been planting on, right on the field next to me they're already starting they already planted I tell you being a farmer today it's it's I tell you what it's got to be a lot easier than it was back a hundred and fifty years ago hundred years ago I was watching this guy and he's he started this morning and he has I mean that's a I don't know uh, what's how many how many acres is that around me that's a lot of land okay this guy he goes out there he tills the thing. And then he goes and he, 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 he treats it with some chemicals and he plants. And then he does it, treats it with something else. He did that and the whole thing is done already and it's not even 6 o'clock. It was pretty much done. I was like, man, don't tell me. I mean, I don't know how I have dirty, uh, 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 being emails from my uh, farmer saying, yeah, you know. Well, it's, not, it's a lot easier than it was 150 years ago. Those guys had to do it with animals and breaking their backs. I mean, it was a lot more difficult being a farmer a hundred years ago, even fifty years ago, the technology has changed everything. This guy just went zipped right through it, you know. And those big, uh, what do you call it, things, uh, the combines, and they have GPS in them and everything. Oh my gosh, unbelievable! Good for the farmers, but you know, not bad. So, anyways, uh, what else? Let's let's teach, uh, let's, let's study the Word of God this evening. We're going to go do Daniel chapter seven, verse ten here this evening, and. Uh, 
uh, we're going to uh, have Daniel describing for us the scene in his vision, the scene around the throne of the Ancient of Days, who he pointed out is God the Father. And uh, we know that because, uh, as we, we point out, several reasons. One is the Son of Man approaches him, and the Son of Man gets a kingdom given to him. And, of course, that's a picture of the Father and the Son. The Son of Man we know is Jesus Christ because that's who he identified as the Son of Man himself, Jesus Christ. And we know that from uh, Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, Philippians 2, that the Father uh, gave uh, uh, Jesus a kingdom and that'll be his millennial kingdom. And that was an obedience as a, as a reward for his obedience in going to the cross to fulfill his will. So let's take a moment of silent prayer to prepare ourselves to, in order to, we, at this time, take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we need to confess any sin to the Father. And then we, if we do, we have to apply 1 John 1, 1.9, which restores the filling of the Spirit and our fellowship with God. Remember, uh, 1 John 1, 1.9 is uh, written uh, in, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So... Uh, when you uh, do what it says, you're filled with the Spirit, which means you're being influenced and guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. And so if the, if the Holy Spirit, you're, you're doing that in obedience to the Holy Spirit, you're filled with the Spirit. That's commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18. So if you confess your sins, it restores the filling of the Spirit and our fellowship with God. You can't have fellowship with God unless you're filled with the Spirit. And uh, we maintain that uh, filling of the Spirit, and our, thus our fellowship with God by obeying the Holy Spirit who speaks to us again through the teaching of the Word of God, which He is, the Word of God, which is He is inspired. So, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for this beautiful, warm day we have here in Iowa. And we just thank you, Father, for getting us through another winter. We thank you, Father, so much for uh, the temporal blessings that we take often for granted, uh, the food, shelter, the clothing, the salaries that we have, the homes that we live in, the, the air conditioning and uh, the heat in the winter. And it's, we're so spoiled, and the heat, even the air conditioning in our cars. Uh, for some of us, uh, we just uh, we thank you, Father, for computers and all this, the phones that we have. It's pretty amazing the technology, Father, and uh, we just thank you, Father, for all these these a lot of the luxury things that we have, and uh, we depend on so much. Uh, we just thank you, Father, more importantly, for our relationship with you and your Son and the Holy Spirit, and with other members of the body of Christ. We thank you, Father, for treating us grace, treating us in a manner that we don't deserve, better than we deserve. We thank you for delivering us from sin and Satan and eternal condemnation, giving us the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit and identifying us with your Son and his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and session at your right hand. We thank you for the baptism of the Spirit, and uh, we just uh, pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to give us understanding and enlightenment as to the great power and love that has been directed toward us because of our union and identification with your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for the study in the book of Daniel. We pray that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work through every single one of us here this evening. We pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to understand what's being taught and to make application. We pray that you would help everyone to concentrate, to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction as well as the communicator. Help him to deliver your full counsel with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power so that the body of Christ is built up and edified and you and your son, Jesus Christ, are magnified. We also pray, Father, that you would help Titus do the sound and the recordings. And we thank you for his service. And we just thank you for Titus and Jody opening up their home to us so that we can teach on a daily basis, Father. So we 
lift up these prayers and requests in thanksgiving. We, and uh, we just pray for these things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. You should be there uh, in your Bibles and also in, uh, in my translation of Daniel chapter 7. Uh, it says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, during Belshazzar's, Babylon's king, first year, Daniel saw a dream, specifically visions in his mind on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream. He dec- declares the beginning of the, c- the account. Daniel began to speak and said, I was in a trance-like state, staring, because of my vision during the night, as behold, the heaven's four winds were blowing violently against the great sea. Then the four great beasts, one different from the other, came up out from the sea. And remember, that is the, a picture of Satan and the kingdom of darkness and what they do with the inhabitants of this world. Remember, the, uh, Satan is the god of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he deceives the entire world. 1 John 5.19. So uh, this is a picture of that. And we know that because uh, it's not it's a picture of the sovereignty of God, though God's sovereignty is obviously involved. However, it's speaking directly of what Satan and the kingdom of darkness do with, the unregenerate, man, with unregenerate mankind. And can I grab a Kleenex there? Excuse me one second. I'm about to sneeze here. Excuse me. So, what we have here is the kingdom of darkness, led by Satan, is going to go and um, it, they're the ones that are uh, blowing violently. The winds, the four winds blowing violently against the sea. That's a picture of Satan in the kingdom of darkness, and uh, what they do with the unregenerate. Uh, uh, human race. Now we know this is because of, of the of what is uh, produced by this the four winds blowing violently against the sea. Four great evil empires: Gentile nations, ki- uh, kingdoms, uh, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and Rome. And uh, we see that uh, the word uh, out of the Roman Empire, the fourth beast, we have the the little horn, and he's Antichrist. So by virtue of what's produced by these uh, by the the four winds blowing violently against the great sea evil empires and antichrist, uh, we see that this has to be Satan in the kingdom of darkness. Now, of course, God, the sovereignty enters into the picture because God has permitted Satan to do this. So in that sense, God's sovereignty is involved, though he is not obviously involved in the evil produced by Satan in the kingdom of darkness. Now look at verse 4. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings attached to it. I was in a trance-like state staring when its wings were torn off. Then it was lifted up from the ground for the purpose of it standing on two feet like a human being. A human mind was also given to it. Now that first beast corresponds to the head of gold in Nebuchadnezzar's statue in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, this, uh, this is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon and the transformation of this beast into a human being is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar after the seven years of discipline when he was disciplined as a believer. And uh, it shows that this is showing him in his obedient state. And then we have the next beast, verse 5. Next, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear with it raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. Then they issued orders to it, arise, devour much flesh. So this is corresponding to the silver uh, arms and chest of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It speaks of Medo Persia. And of course, uh, like a bear that uh, it's powerful but slow and, and ponderous, so was the Medo Persian Empire. They would feel two million man armies to defeat their, uh, their opponents. And so uh, this is a good characterization of the Medo Persian Empire. Now we see it's raised up to one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. Raised up on, on its one side is speaking the fact that Persia would be, of the, between Media and Persia, Persia would be the most dominant of the two kingdoms. History bears that out. And uh, we see that the three ribs in its mouth, that's speaking of previous conquests. Uh, we have uh, uh, Babylon, Assyria, and Egypt. They, when it says arise and devour much flesh, that's saying take on, uh, have more conquests. And that's what happened to Ma- uh, Medo Persia. They went on for, they reigned for over 200 years, They uh, much longer than the, the Neo Babylonian Empire started by Nebuchadnezzar and his son Nebuchadnezzar. Then it says in verse 6 after this, I was staring in a trance like state, as behold, another one was like a leopard, another beast was like a leopard, with it having four birds' wings on its back. Also, the beast had four heads 
Indeed, governmental dominion was given to it. This is this third beast corresponds to the, the belly of bronze and upper thighs of bronze and Nebuchadnezzar's statue. It speaks of Alexander the Great's Greek Empire. Uh, the characterization as a leopard is appropriate, of course. A leopard is fast. This leopard has four wings on its back. That speaks of the fact that this uh, nation, which represented by this third beast, would have a, uh, would uh, conquer nations with a speed that was uh, beyond its capacity. And of course, God uh, was behind uh, 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 Alexander the Great's conquest. He was given governmental dominion by God, it says here. And when it says that, the, when it speaks of the four heads, that speaks of the four generals of, uh, of Alexander the Great who succeeded him when he died at the uh, a young age of 32 of alcoholism and complications from alcoholism and malaria, it looks like. Uh, he was succeeded by these four generals. They divvied up his empire. So uh, 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 Alexander the Great, uh, he had a 30, you know, he'd have an army of 32,000, 40,000 men, and he'd conquer the Persians who had, uh, you know, millions. You know, they'd have a million man army out there, or two million. So he was that good. And he went all the way to eat India, and the only reason why he didn't go go further is because he wore out his army. They had gone as far as they could go, and he, he of course, could have kept going if, if he uh, was given the chance. So this is uh, Alexander the Great's Greek Empire here, being represented by the leopard with the four wings and the four heads. Verse 7, After this, I was continuing to stare in a trance-like state because of these night visions, as behold, a fourth beast, Intimidating, intimidating, yes, even terrifying, as well as extremely powerful, possessing two large rows of iron teeth. It devoured as well as crushed. Specifically, it violently crushed the rest with its feet. Indeed, it was characterized as different from all the beasts which were before it in the sense of possessing ten horns. So this is, you know, it's not, as you can see, it's a nondescript beast, meaning it's not resembling any type of animal we know in our in our world and the on the earth so it's a nondescript beast it has a lot two large rows of iron teeth the iron uh, should cause us to think back to Nebuchadnezzar's statue because it corresponds this fourth beast corresponds to the lower legs of iron and Nebuchadnezzar's statue this is a picture of the Roman Empire the description here of, uh, of this beast that it crushes everything uh, this is it violently crushes and it uh, devours as well as crushed. And it, uh, it's characterized as different from all the beasts w which were before it. The Roman Empire, that's what they were, they were called, the military, the, uh, the, the legions of the Roman uh, army, they were called the Iron Legions because they wore iron. Iron, which uh, the Greeks had bronze, and iron is stronger than bronze. So we have Rome conquered Greece, uh, and they, they reigned, uh, well, the, 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 the Republic and then the, uh, the Empire for about 500 years, and they went on further after that, uh, with the eastern and western part of the empire that got split up. Uh, so what we have here is a picture of the Roman Empire, and we see that on this particular beast, we have ten horns. That's corresponding to the feet and the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, which were composed partly of iron and partly of clay. And that's a, a, a revived form of the Roman Empire, which we have yet to see yet in history. So what we've pointed out, this book is a great for apologetics, we see that in this chapter, the first, uh, the first uh, four beasts have been fulfilled in, in history. Uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Uh, we have a final form of the Roman Empire, the ten horns, the feet of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That is yet to come. And so this is what Daniel sees here in his vision. He's going to emphasize this particular beast, the fourth beast. And uh, so this tells us, uh, because we haven't seen this yet, we're going to see, and we saw this in chapter 2, there's going to be a revived form of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire existed in Europe. So that's why I believe it's going to be a ten-nation European confederacy. And I think it's going to come out of there. And, uh, and uh, we're going to have more information given to us about the Roman Empire. We get to chapter 9. But we're going to have something to say about uh, Antichrist, a little more information about him, what he's going to do during De Daniel's 70th week. So then it says in verse 8, I was contemplating in a trance-like state because of these horns, the ten horns, which represent the revived form of the Roman Empire, which is yet future. How, why is it future? Because we haven't seen anything, a ten-nation European confederacy in Rome ever in history. Never happened in, in Rome's history. So we know it's future. So I was continue, contemplating in a trance-like state because of these horns, as behold, another little horn emerged out from among them. 
Then the first tree originating from the horns was torn out by being in the presence of it, the little horn. In fact, behold, on this horn, the little horn, were eyes like a human being's eyes, as well as a mouth speaking boastfully. This is a picture of the Antichrist. It corresponds, uh, as we'll see a later description of the, of the little horn, it corresponds to what Revelation says the Antichrist will do. So then uh, we have in verse 9, and he'll be a Roman dictator. He comes from the Roman Empire. He's, he's, he's going to come from the people, of the, print, uh, the people of the prince who is to come. That in Daniel 9.26 tells us that he'll be a Roman. This also tells us he's a Roman. Because this, fourth, uh, this horn, little horn, emerges from what beast? The fourth beast. What's that? The Roman Empire. And we know specifically he'll be a Roman, not just from the Roman Empire, one of these nations that composes the Roman Empire, but he, in fact, will be a Roman which I think is significant uh, because if you read Revelation 13, which corresponds, the first 10 verses correspond to chapter 7 of the book of Daniel, and then if you get to verse 11 of chapter 13 of the book of Revelation and read through the end of the chapter, there's another beast who's like a lamb in appearance, meek and mild. I believe that's going to be one of the popes. I don't know if it's going to be which one it's going to be, but I think it's going to be one of those guys. I think it's interesting. I, that make, would make sense because... Roman Catholic, uh, the Pope is housed where? And the Ro Roman Catholic Church, the center for that is Rome. So I think it's all going to be there in Rome. And uh, there's a lot of other things I could talk about. I'm not going to talk about it here. Uh, maybe at a later date I will. But there's a lot of things about Rome and Europe that's going on. Uh, they want to bring this uh, a European Confederacy. That's not uh, any, uh, that's no uh, secret. That's been, they've been trying to do that for a while. So this is what we have here. Now, we have a picture of what's going to go on the earth for us, from our perspective in the 21st century, which already has taken place in one other aspect of the beast, the ten horns, which is yet to take place. So we see all these terrible empires uh, uh, deceived and governed by sin and Satan, but God's going to give now in verses 9 and 10, give us the reader, and Daniel in the 6th century BC and the Jewish people in exile, going to give them comfort by the next two verses. Look at verse 9. I was continuing to stare in a trance-like state when thrones were set up. Then the one, ancient in days, sat. His clothing was, like, was white like snow. Also the hair of his head was like the lamb's wool. Was like lamb's wool, excuse me. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were blazing fire. Now, the picture here of the ancient of days, it's a picture of the father. Uh, he, uh, what we see here, remember this is a vision. It's apocalyptic literature about a real, right at this point, about a real person, the Father. We know he's the Father because the Son of Man comes up to him and receives a kingdom. And according to New Testament interpretation, that's the Father giving Jesus Christ his kingdom. Jesus Christ identified himself as the Son of Man in Daniel 7. So we know the Ancient of Days speaks of the Father. That's important because when we look at the phrase uh, most high later on in the chapter, that's not going to be a reference to the Father, as I'll point out. That's going to be a reference to the Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. And uh, I always used to think it was, it was the Father, but, uh, or just the Trinity in general. No, it's a speaking, most high is speaking of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. So uh, we have here a description of the Father. Uh, his, uh, his, uh, his clothing was white like uh, was like white like snow that's a picture of his holiness the absolute perfection of god's character he has he has no sin or evil anything like that is in the father in fact we know it's sin and evil by virtue if we compare it to the father's character which is pure so the, the holiness of god is the is the sum total of the divine attributes or perfections of god now his the hair of his head was like lamb's wool that speaks of the wisdom of god which is based upon his omniscience and his omniscience and his ability to make a plan and bring it to fruition then his if, then we have the two statements here his throne was fiery flames and its wheels were a blazing fire speaks of his justice that fact that he's a god of justice he's a judge it speaks of the fact that god is judge and we're going to have a lot to say about that here this evening we've had something to say about in the past and we'll continue to talk about god being judge and everyone's going to have to give an account to god so that we see here that his the fiery flame speaks of the fact that he's judges 
And the wheels speaks that he is, uh, he is uh, throughout the earth. There's no uh, creature, no, not, not even Satan, that's outside his jurisdiction. Uh, his uh, his uh, justice, he executes his justice throughout the earth. All we have to do is look at history. History is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is strewn with the wreckage of nations, empires, who have been judged by God. Whether it's God's own people, Israel, or the Roman Empire, or Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, uh, uh, nations come and nations fall. Kings rise, uh, come to power and they are deposed by God, as Daniel told us in Daniel chapter 2. So then we get a description uh, more about what the function of God as a judge here in chapter in verse 10. Look at uh, verse 10, and I'm going to read from the New American Standard at this point. Let me just sh- take care of this here. All right, it says in Daniel 7.10, a river of fire... Now I'm reading from the New American Standard. A river of fire was flowing and coming out before him. Now it's interesting, uh, there's no uh, connective word between the last statement in verse 9 and this first statement in verse 10. That's the figure of a syndeton. Why is that important? Because it's telling us that this is important, this description of what's coming out from the throne uh, of, the, of, the, of the ancient of days, the Father. We had a picture in verse 9 of the Father, the description. Now we're having a description of what's going on around the throne of the Father, the ancient of days. This first statement, uh, we have no connective word between it and its pre- the previous statement in verse 9. That's the figure of a senaton. That means the Holy Spirit, through Daniel, wants us to think about this. A river of fire was flowing out before him. Then we get, again, another, the figure of a syndicaton appears again. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. And myriads upon myriads were standing before him. God wants us to think about this. Meditate about what this means, the significance of it. And then it says, and the court sat and the books were open. Uh, this is important too, because it's, uh, we have the figure of a syndicaton there as well in this last statement. Because this last statement there in verse 10 is telling us that God is going to judge the, the Antichrist, the little horn, and that fourth beast. Now, when it says a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him, that speaks in symbolic terms. This is, this is symbolic. How do we know that? Because it's not, it's not literal. It's symbolic of literal events and people and things. And uh, it's because we have apocalyptic literature here. This is a vision. This is a vision. That's very important. When people go to interpret the Bible, they get all kind of screw up and they, they interpret things as being literal. Like, for instance, is the father's hair as white as wool? No. We don't even know what the father looks like. This is a picture for our frame of reference because when we look at white hair, we think of somebody with wisdom and that's, it's appealing to our frame of reference. So the symbolic language here, the description of the father, the father is real. And he is wise and holy. All these things that are signified by the description of him here. And we, we need to understand that. But this is a vision that Daniel had of the Father and, uh, in, the, in his throne. So we have here, a river of fly, fire was flowing out and coming out from before him. That speaks in symbolic terms that God the Father issues judgments against men and nations. And here it is with regards to the Antichrist. What's important to understand the fire speaks of judgment. This is not just a light show, okay? When you go to a rock concert and they put on a light show, you know, expl- like you go to Kiss and they, boom, you know, they have the fires going off, you know, and explosions and, uh, you know, all, all stuff like that. No, that, this wasn't for effect. This, is, this p- description, the fire, is telling us something about who the Father is because fire in the Bible speaks of God's judgment. So this is what it's talking about. And this is important. This is important because uh, we're going to see that he's going to judge the little horn. He's going to judge the Antichrist. It says thousands upon thousands. That's composed of the noun alaf, which is translated here correctly, thousands. And then that's in the singular form there. But then the next time the word appears again, but in the plural form. And it's uh, translated here upon thousands. Now the first time that alaf occurs in the singular form, it does mean a thousand. And the second time, it's in the plural, and it means thousands. So that's good. So the singular form of the word is in the construct state. And that simply means that it's governing this word, the singular form of the word, Allah, thousand, is, a thousands, is governing, excuse me, a thousand, it's governing the second time the word appears after it. It's governing the word that follows it. So uh, this first time it appears, it's in the singular form. 
It actually means thousand. I, I, it's not thousands plural. It should mean actually means a thousand. It's in the construct state in, in the Aramaic. That means it's governing the word that follows it and expressing a genitive relation. Now here, the genitive is a genitive of number. This indicates how many there are of the construct term. So what, this, what I'm telling you is this word literally means a thousand times a thousand. That's exactly what it means. And it means that a thousand times a thousand were continually, continually rendering worshipful service to the Ancient of Days. It's hyperbole for a lot of people. It's hyperbole for innumerable amount of people that are at the throne worshiping and worshipfully, worshipfully serving the Ancient of Days, the Father. Now, when it says we're attending Him, that's the pa'el in perfect form of the word, shamash, which is translated we're attending. It actually means to serve. Its object is the third person masculine singular, pronominal suffix who, translated here, him, referring to the Father. It's correctly translated, of course. The word shamash means to serve, and it describes the individual's Attending's not bad. That's, that's, not, that's nothing wrong with that. It gets the idea across. The word serve, uh, shamash, means to serve or attend, and it describes the individuals around the throne of the Ancient of Days as serving the Ancient of Days, but with emphasis upon their low status in comparison to the Ancient of Days. And it also speaks of reverence and worshiping the Ancient of Days. So this service is a worshipful service. Now this verse speaks of these unidentified individuals serving worshipfully at the throne of the Ancient of Days. And uh, so what's interesting about this is that we'll, when we get to the end of the class this evening, we're going to find out when this takes place. And this is actually a vision of a group of people, and we're going to be among those group of people. Because uh, when this takes place, this vision, it's going to be in the future just before Jesus Christ comes back at his second advent to, de to, de to defeat, um, to uh, imprison Satan for a thousand years and to establish his millennial reign and to throw the false prophet and the beast, the Antichrist, into the lake of fire and, and, and establish his millennial kingdom. It's going to happen at that time. Well, we'll be in heaven with him and then we come back with him. So the picture here is taking place right at the end of the tribulation period. So that means that we would be there. So that's quite interesting. So uh, we're going to be a, a, one in, we'll be in that number. When the saints go marching in, oh, how I wish to be in that number. Good song. Now the imperfect conjugation of the verb, shamash here, is a customary or state of imperfect. And that simply means to you and I, it describes an action that is done habitually or continuously, indicating that this innumerable amount of unidentified individuals were continuously or habitually rendering worshipful service to the ancient of days at his throne. A lot of people get this picture of heaven that we're not going to be doing anything. Like we're on a, you know, on a, on a cloud, floating around with a harp. Now that looks like a really boring, and it would be, you know. I mean, I, I like playing my guitar, but sitting on a, on a cloud for all of eternity playing my guitar on a, you know, blah, blah. No, you're going to have work to do. You'll have work to do. You'll be serving God. I don't know what that's going to be for you and me. We'll find out. We'll find out what our jobs are in the future. So we're not going to be bored. Far from it. It's going to be heaven. We'll be perfected. So it's going to be, in, in fact, uh, on the earth right now, what does it say? The curse, part of the curse, man's curse, the thorns and thistles the earth will produce. You have to work by the sweat of your brow. and Work is not always... Uh, uh, you don't always get what you put into your work. You know, like I think about my father, and he worked three jobs. One of the hardest working, you know, a lot of you guys could probably say the same about your father. One of the hardest working guys that ever knew. We had three jobs for years. I mean, if you would talk, if, if uh, making, if being, getting rich was about the amount of work you put in, my father would be w richer than Bill Gates and Rockefeller together. But because we're under the curse, that you don't, you know, you, the work you put in, you don't usually get, often get back what you put into your work. What, or you don't get what you, you, you're, you, you deserve in your pay. And uh, that's true. That's because we, uh, this, we're in a cursed world. We're in a world that's fallen. And so we won't be in a fallen world in millennial reign of Christ. The curse will be lifted. So uh, work will be much more uh, gratifying. We'll, whatever we're doing will be very gratifying. If you're happy with your job now and you get a lot of satisfaction out of it, great. But in the eternal state, in the millennial reign of Christ, in the resurrection body, Work will be satisfying 
and you'll be uh, you'll get a, pro- a proper you get a lot of satisfaction you'll get a lot of perfect satisfaction from what God has you do. Uh, so uh, that's in contrast to what we has what we have today. And then it says, which continuing Daniel continues to describe the what's going on around the throne of the ancient of days here in verse ten. It says, "In myriads upon myriads were standing before him." That statement is advancing upon. It's emphatic. It's in, because it's advancing upon and intensifying the previous statement that a thousand times a thousand of under, unidentified individuals were continually rendering worshipful service to the ancient of days. So thus the advancement and intensification is that there was not only an innum- innumerable amount of individuals worshipfully serving the ancient of days, but also an even greater amount standing at his throne waiting to serve him. So the picture is you got people who are serving him and then there are other people waiting to serve him. And we, don't, we can't count the number. Thousand, a thousand times upon a thousand, myriads upon a myriads, it's saying there's, it's hyperbole, meaning you can't count the number. You can't count the number, how many people who are serving him, worshipfully serving him, and who are waiting to do so. So myriads upon myriads, a very similar construction here to a th- a thousands upon a thousands. We have myriads upon myriads is composed of two words. We have first the singular form of the word ribo, which is translated myriads. And then the plural form follows it, which is translated upon myriads. Now the first time ribo appears... It uh, appears in the singular form, and it thus means 10,000. And the second time, it's in the plural, and it means 10,000s, plural. Now, the singular form of the word is in the construct state, and it means it's governing the plural form of the word, expressing a genitive relation, and here it's a genitive of number. That indicates how many there are of the construct uh, form. Now, this indicates literally that 10,000 times 10,000 were standing before the throne of the Ancient of Days, in other words, it's hyperbole. What's hyperbole? It's exaggeration. It's, 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 it's actually um, 10,000 uh, myriads upon myriads. That's not an accurate description. It, it, you can't, it, it's another way of saying it's innumerable amount of people. Uh, you can't count them. As many, you ever hear this term? As many as the sand on the seashore. You know, I'll, Abraham, I'll, your descendants will be more than the sand on the seashore. Can you count the sand? The sand on the seashore? No, you can't. That's the picture we got here. Now, when it says we're standing before him, we have a prepositional phrase here. We have the preposition kadam, translated here before, and then its object is the third person masculine singular pronominal suffix who, translated here, him referring to the ancient of days, of course. Now, then we have the verb, the pa'al, imperfect form of the verb kum, which we've seen quite a bit in the book of Daniel, in the Aramaic portion of Daniel. It's translated here, we're standing. Now, this is, uh, word kum is correctly translated. It indicates that 10,000 times 10,000s were standing in the presence of the ancient of days waiting to serve him. The imperfect conjugation of the verb in, is a customary or state of imperfect, just like uh, in, uh, in the previous uh, phrase, uh, shamash, were attending him, that verb shamash, serve, attending, that was also and in, in the imperfect conjugation, and it was a customary or state of imperfect like the verb uh, we have here, kum. And that uh, describes this imperfect conjugation, the customary or habitual, uh, we call it the uh, state of imperfect. It indicates something that's done habitually, hab- habitually or continuously. So that would mean here that indicates that this innumerable amount of unidentified individuals who we'll identify later this evening were continuously or habitually rendering worshipful service to the Ancient of Days at his throne. So when it says in mere, uh, uh, they'll be uh, uh, they'll be continuously, excuse me, they'll be continuously or habitually standing in the presence of the Ancient of Days, waiting to render worshipful service to him. The word uh, that was translated attending, uh, shamash. The, the perfect conjugation there meant that they these innumerable amount of individuals, unidentified individuals, were habitually or continuously rendering worshipful service to the ancient of days at his throne. The word kum in the imperfect conjugation means that they were another group that was continuously or habitually standing, waiting to serve him. So the picture is, uh, uh, it's, it's, try, it's trying to draw a picture for the ancient mind. Daniel would understand what that is because Daniel was in courts, royal courts. He was in Nebuchadnezzar's court, Belshazzar's court, 
and he'd be in, in, in uh, uh, he'll be in uh, Darius's court. What do I mean by a king's court? They had people attending to the king. Uh, you go to the White House. The president, he's got people wa- waiting to serve him, different attendants, different people. The people that have different jobs, a lot of people there. And when the royal courts in Daniel's day, they had a lot of people serving the king, doing different things, waiting for, to serve him, waiting for, hold the door for him when he got up or whatever, you know, and, and, and all these things that they had. That's the picture that the Holy Spirit's trying to draw for Daniel in this vision of the father here, the ancient of days, but it's a superior throne because it's the heavenly throne of the creator, of, the, of our father who created this world through his son, Jesus Christ. The time, matter, space, continuum he created through his son. So this is the picture we have here. It's trying to impress upon Daniel. This, there's a heavenly court, which is a greater court than these earthly courts that you have been used to, Daniel. This one you know about, heard about. Well, now you're seeing it in a vision. A, a, draw, I'm trying to draw a picture of you for Daniel of this heavenly court. Now, when it says the court sat, an interesting little phrase here. It's composed of two words. We have the, the word for court. The court, it's the uh, noun dean. And then we have the word for sat. It's the verb, yathib. Yathib is in the pe'al, uh, perfect form. Now, this word dean that's translated the court, it's correctly translated. It, it's referring, actually, to a session of the heavenly court which was conducted by the Ancient of Days. And it literally means the judgment, sat, which is a figurative, it's used here in a figurative sense, meaning that the court was convened by the Ancient of Days. Let me give you a picture. When you go into a courtroom, have you ever been to a courtroom before? When the judge comes in, everybody stands up. Okay? He sits down, the court is convened. Court bit, the, the, uh, now we're going to have the lawyer's approach or whatever has to be done, and the, the, uh, the court is convened. That's the picture here. So when it says that the, the, uh, the, uh, the judgment sat here, or the court sat, it's saying that the Ancient of Days, when he sat down on his throne, that meant the court was convened. And there was a reason for it. Because they were going to open up some scrolls, as we'll say, which contain evidence which will bring about the conviction of the Antichrist, the little horn here, the, the, uh, the willful king. Now the word yathib, it's translated here sat, it literally means to be seated, to sit, it's correctly translated. It indicates that the judgment sat, but that's what it means literally here, this phrase, but it actually is figurative for a court convening. When, you court, when a, a court is convened, that means the judges come in, now court business, the, 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 whatever the trial, whatever has to be done, the lawyers have to do, go about their business, now the court, the, the, now we can start. The judge is here. The court is convened. That's the picture here. So Yathib and this word Dean, the court, are used in a figurative sense, meaning the court was convened in the sense that Daniel saw a vision of the one ancient days, the father, convening a session in the courtroom of heaven. Now, this is quite interesting. You know, we talk about the angelic conflict, and you hear me talk about that, and Satan, and that there's a... Thr- Actually, human history is a courtroom drama. We know that because of many things. First of all, uh, all the allusions to a courtroom. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Satan, the terms Satan, and, uh, dia- uh, devil, Satanas, Diabolos, the devil. Those are legal terms talking about that Satan is a, 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 a defense attorney for the, himself and the fallen angels. And then you have things like, uh, you, ever, you hear the term martyr, uh, well, the word there is talking about somebody who's a witness. Jesus is called the faithful witness. Uh, so there's a lot. Uh, we see in Zechariah 3, Satan is in the throne room of God, and he's accusing the Jewish high priest at that time. And, and, and then the Lord steps in and says, rebuke, uh, Lord, rebuke you, Satan. And he defends the, the high priest of Israel. Uh, we see in Revelation chapter 12, Satan is at the throne accusing the brethren day and night. He accuses us before the throne of God. And, and we, uh, we see in, uh, in Job chapters 1 and 2, there's a courtroom drama there. You get Job comes into the picture. So there's, there's, there's a courtroom in heaven. What, we, what it looks like, we're getting, we're, we're, God's trying to draw our picture for us here with his vision, but it's much more magnificent than we could ever put into human words. Human words could not actually describe what we see here. That's why I say, Heaven is going to be much, much more spectacular than even what the, the biblical writers try to convey in human language. Human language does not really do justice, I believe, to what heaven is truly going to be like. 
and what it's going to look like. So the book, when it says the books were open, uh, that's uh, we have here a result clause. This is a result clause. And th that means it presents the result of the previous statement that the court was convened. So what it's saying is that the court was convened with the result that the books were open. Now, the books were open. The funny thing about this translation, and uh, I don't know what, uh, let me see if I can get the uh, translations of these other, other Bibles here. Let's see what they say. Give me a min minute here. What is that, Daniel 7.10? I got a, a new, numerous translations I have here. Uh, the Net Bible, uh, they translated, the court was convened and the books were open. Uh, the New American Standard, books were open. ESV, books were open. Uh, Lexham Bible, books were open. NIV, books were open. NRSV, books were open. Everybody says books were open, pretty much every English translation. Well, the funny thing is, back in the 6th century BC, no books were open. They had scrolls. Daniel wouldn't know what a book if it hit him in the head. A book didn't come around, what's kind of interesting, books didn't come around codexes until the Christian church wanted to put the New Testament writings and the Old Testament together. Books actually were invented by Christians, by the way. People don't know that. That's a fact. Christians are the ones who started books. Before that, you had scrolls. Remember Paul says in Second Timothy, hey, remember this, bring the scrolls, Timothy. I mean, you imagine, we have a picture of Paul when he's studying scrolls all over the place, okay? They didn't have books, codexes, codices. That came in the first, first second, second century, first, second century, when Christians wanted to try to put all together their writings together. So that's, that's something little people don't really real, realize. Now, when it says the books were open, uh, I'm going to show you that it actually means scrolls. The word sefar is translated here, books. And then we have the verb. We have the pe'il, perfect form of the word pethak, which is uh, translated here, were opened. Now, the word sefar doesn't mean books. It's in the plural. It actually means scrolls. And it doesn't mean books in the sense of a codex, since they were non-existent in the 6th century B.C. when Daniel penned this book which bears his name. Now, I don't know what they have in heaven. For all we know, we have some kind of elaborate computer system in heaven, for all I know. I don't know. But they didn't have... Daniel, he's in the 6th century BC. He would know what a book is. He couldn't describe for you what a book was. He'd know what a scroll was. Books weren't invented yet. So this is another thing to tell you. It's a vision. He's trying to... God speaking to Daniel's frame of reference. Now, listen to me. If, if, if God gave us this vision in the 21st century, he would communicate to you and I in our 21st century frame of reference. Because he wants us to understand something about something that maybe his words, his vocabulary couldn't describe at a particular time. At that particular time, so we got scrolls here. It refers to this word sefar refers to a scroll, which was likely made of vellum or papyrus, which contained what contained what was on it. It contained information relevant to the judgment of an individual. It's a court convened. Scrolls are open. What's going on? What's on the scrolls? Information that's going to bring about the judgment of a particular individual. Who is going to be the little horn, the king represented by the little horn, who we know as the Antichrist. So here, this word ref safar refers to the scrolls containing the record of the evidence which will bring about the conviction and execution of the little horn since verse 11 describes God judging the little horn. See, if you look at verse, if you look at verse 11, which, what follows what follows on the heels of what follows on the heels? I had it. What follows on the heels of the books being opened, the scrolls being opened? It's got information on it of an, of an, for a judgment of an individual. Who could be the individual? Read the next verse. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was burned, given to the burning fire. Who was on the, what, what, what little horn was on the fourth beast? That's the beast, fourth beast being destroyed, the Roman Empire. That would mean the little horn's judged too because he's on the fourth beast, that horn, right? And so that's, and he's going to be a, a Roman, a revi leader of the revived form of the Roman Empire during Daniel's 70th week. So what we have here is the judgment of the Roman Empire here, and in particular the revived form of the Roman Empire under Antichrist. That's what we see here. So verse 11 tells us what was on these scrolls. It was the evidence that would bring about the conviction and judgment of Antichrist in his revived form of the Roman Empire. Now the word pethak, 
translated here, were opened, correctly translated, it refers to the unrolling of a scroll which contains the record of evidence to bring about the conviction and death of the little horn. Now let me give you my translation of verse 10, and we got a lot of things to talk about in a short bit of time about this uh, particular um, verse. When it says a river, it, uh, I'm reading from my translation of verse 10, a river composed of fire was flowing, Daniel says, yes, issuing forth from his presence. Whose presence? The Ancient of Days. A thousand times a thousand were continually rendering worshipful service to him. In fact, 10,000 times 10,000 were continually standing in his presence. The court convened, resulting in scrolls being opened. Now, as we saw in verse 9, we read earlier, Daniel presents to the reader a description of the Ancient of Days himself, who we know is the Father. Whereas verse 10 is presenting a description of the scene around the throne of the ancient, day, ancient of Days, which is composed of four statements here in verse 10. For this, since this scene appeared to Daniel in a vision, these statements are describing in symbolic terms that the Father is the judge of all of his creatures. They, thus they also symbolize or emphasize in symbolic terms that he is sovereign all of, over all of his creatures and all of, all of his creation. Now this first statement here in verse 10, a river of fire composed, a river composed of fire was flowing, yes, issuing forth from his presence. That first statement describes in symbolic terms that the Father issues judgments of nations and people. We know that by history because nations rise and nations fall. God's own, the Jewish people, deported from their land, judged. They were brought back in the land not too long ago, 1948. You know, Roman uh, we said Roman Empire used to be dominate the earth. Now the United States is the superpower. And China and Russia, that'll change. Okay, we used to see uh, we used to see Babylon, uh, uh, Gr Alexander's Greece. Where are those empires now? Where's Media Persia? They used to they used to dominate and rule the earth. Where are they now? God's judgment. A lot of nations like the Hittites. We didn't even think that they existed. They thought the Bible's full of baloney about the Hittites. Who were the Hittites? Well, they just found it. Archaeology has discovered there was the, the, where the Hittite people were, and they never thought they existed, scholars, liberal scholars. Well, the Bible was right all the time. Of course it is. And they found out the Bible was right. The, the Hittite civilization was huge. Where are the Hittites? God, judged by God, like the rest of those Canaanite people. So uh, this, uh, the second statement that we have here, uh, where it says a thousand times a thousand were continually rendering worshipful service to him. That second statement also describes symbolically that the Father receives worshipful service from an innumerable amount of individuals whose identity is not revealed to us by Daniel. The third statement is intensive. It's, it's the statement, in fact, 10,000 times 10,000 were continually sta standing in his presence the Ancient of Days presence, that third statement is emphatic because it intensifies and advances upon that second statement and it describes symbolically that another host of innumerable unidentified individuals were standing around the throne of the Father waiting to render worshipful service as well. Now the fourth and final st statement, the court convened resulting in scrolls being opened, that describes the Supreme Court of Heaven being convened resulting in scrolls being opened which contain information regarding the evidence against an individual who we saw in verse 11 is the little horn who is going to be the leader, the Antichrist, who is going to be the leader of the revived form of the Roman Empire during Daniel's 70th week. This evidence against the Antichrist would be the record of his blasphemous actions during Daniel's 70th week and his persecution and murder of God's people. Therefore, since Daniel 7.11 speaks of God judging the Antichrist, this scene described in verse 10 is that of the Father passing judgment against the Antichrist. Also, don't miss this, since Daniel 9.27 and Revelation 13.1-10 make clear that the Antichrist will be the leader of a 10-nation European confederacy and eventually a worldwide ruler during the 70th week of Daniel, the scene described in Daniel 7.10 is also during the same period of time. Daniel 7.10 is thus describing, in symbolic terms, a future event that will take place at the end of Daniel's 70th week in which the Father will pass judgment on the Antichrist, which will result in his death and his being deposited into the eternal lake of fire. What's interesting is we see in Revelation 19 and 20, 
Who gets thrown in the lake of fire first? Satan or the Antichrist and the false prophet? It's the Antichrist and the false prophet. Satan is in prison for a thousand years. Then he gets released, starts another rebellion. God destroys that rebellion. And then he gets thrown into the lake of fire at the end of human history. But the, the Antichrist and the false prophet are executed first. And what's interesting, when they go to deposit Satan in the, anti, uh, in the lake of fire, his judgment is executed. Who's there? And it says they're still there alive, suffering in the eternal lake of fire. But the false prophet and the Antichrist now, so that what we have here is that Daniel 7.10 is thus describing in symbolic terms a future event that will take place at the end of Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation period, in which the Father will pass judgment on the Antichrist, which will result in his death and being deposited into the eternal lake of fire. So the scene described in symbolic terms in verses 9 and 10 of Daniel chapter 7 is of future events that will take place at the end of Daniel's 70th week. Uh, Daniel's 70th week, uh, quickly, go over to Daniel chapter 9 in case you're wondering about that. I've talked about it a lot. I've described it for in the past. Let me go over it real quickly and tell you what it is. It's not a literal week. It's a, in this prophecy, when we get to it, I'll describe why it's not. It's a, we know it's seven, it's, a week is seven years in this prophecy. So there's 490. 70 weeks of Daniel means literally 77s. And it means... It refers to 490 prophetic years of Daniel's of, of Israel's history. 483 of which has already come to pass. The prophecy is right now at this point stopped with Christ's crucifixion. We're still waiting for the final seven years, which is described for us in Daniel 9:27, and also parts of Daniel 7 where Antichrist, the little horn, wages war against God's people. That's during this last seven-year period. So. Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people, not your people, your people, the church, but your people, Israel, speaking of Israel, and your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you were to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which is which has actually already taken place. That's 444 B.C. Artaxerxes Longamanus, that's his decree it's referring to. We know that from history. So you were to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, miss, don't miss this. Seven weeks means 49 years. Then there's another, six, it says 62 weeks. That's 434 years. So add 434 years to the seven weeks. Okay? What do you got? Do the math. Get 483 years. For, 49 years plus the four, 434. Okay? So we have here, yeah, that, that's, that, so we have, they're going one on top of the other. And it will be built again, Jerusalem, with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, now listen to me. Yeah, that doesn't mean, it, it, that means after the 483 years because you, it's, it's continuously. The seven weeks, that's 49 years. Then you got the 62 weeks, all right? The 49 weeks, uh, the 49 years, which is seven weeks, is speaking of the period when they, they rebuilt Jerusalem. Then there's another group of 434 years. That's what he's talking about there. So at the end of that, the Messiah will be cut off. That's the execution of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion. And have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the people of the prince who is to come, the people of the Romans, history tells us they destroyed Jerusalem and the, tore down the temple and uh, in fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. And that was in 70 AD. And notice the people, the prince who is to come is, comes from these people, the Romans. And its end, Jerusalem's end, will come with a flood. He goes, explains it. Even to the end, there'll be war. Desolations are determined. Now, verse 27 is yet future. And we know that because nothing described in there as it corresponds to anything we know of history with the Jewish people and the Romans and everything. Verse 27 says, And he, the prince who is to come, he will make a firm covenant with the many, the Jews. He hasn't done that yet. That hasn't happened yet in history. 
for one week, seven years. We've never seen this in Israel's history. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice after three and a half years, after, at the middle of the week, seven years, three and a half years, the 1260 days. It's in Revelation 11, 2, other, another place in Revelation speaks of the 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years. It's in Daniel 2. It's also in, in, in Daniel chapter 7, we say. That's, the, that's what he's saying. In the, after three and a half years, in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. Basically, that's, that's, that's something good in Daniel 7, we'll see. He, uh, he'll make alterations to times and law. That's what it's speaking of. He's speaking of the fact that the Jewish festivals and the sacrifices, he's going to interrupt that. That's what it refers to. Always wanted to know what that, I really looked at that. That's what it's referring to. And on the wing of abominations, and the only guy I know that agrees, that I know of so far that agrees with me is Bob Bolander down in Texas. That's, he, came up, he, he, he came up with the same conclusion. I checked on what he had to say, and, and, that's, and that's what he comes to his conclusion. I believe he's right. He's on the good side. He's on, he, got, he, he agrees with me, so he must be right. No, I'm just kidding. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate, the Antichrist. Well, have we seen that? Have we ever seen a, a, a Roman dictator stop the Jewish sacrifices? We don't even have the Jewish temple built right now. It's been down for over 2,000 years. So this, that has to be future. That's the 70th week of Daniel. That means between verses 26 and 27, that's where you and I, the church age, are. It's called an intercalation in theology. So right in between there, that shows you, this, you see this a lot in prophecy. You see this with pictures of Jesus Christ's first advent and then stop. And then what, the, the rest of it is, ready, is waiting to be filled for his second advent. You see that a lot, like in Isaiah. You see that quite a bit. So that's the 70th week of Daniel. And that's described in detail in Revelation chapters 6 all the way through 19. It ends with Christ coming back in the second advent. He comes back with the church, elect angels, and puts down the Antichrist and prison Satan for a thousand years. The 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation period, is divided in two sections. The first three and a half years, wars and rumors of war. Antichrist ascends to power. In the middle of the week, he declares himself as God, puts an end to the Jewish sacrifices that are reinstituted, re stops that, sets himself up as God, the abomination of desolation, war breaks out, that's the Armageddon campaign. That Beginning there, that's the last, starts the last three and a half years, which ends with the second advent of Christ. So now you can go back to Daniel chapter 7. So what we see here is that the, 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 the scene described in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, is of future events that will take place at the end of Daniel's 70th week. In fact, these verses are describing symbolically the events that will take place which will bring an end to the times of the Gentiles, which will be followed by Jesus Christ's judgment of the Jews, followed by the Gentiles. At his second advent, Jesus Christ, just prior to his millennial reign, will first judge Israel when he lands on planet Earth. This judgment involves the removal of unsaved Israel from the Earth, leaving only regenerate Israel to enter the millennial reign of Christ. Look at Ezekiel 20, verses 37 and 38. We study this in our Day of the Lord series. Of course, most of Israel, in contrast to the first advent of Christ, at the second advent of Christ, the majority of Israel will get saved. Only a remnant, a small group, will reject him. They'll be taken off the earth in judgment. This will immediate, the judgment of the Jews is immediately followed by the, the Lord Jesus Christ judging the Gentiles, which involves the removal of unregenerate anti-Semitic Gentiles from the earth, Matthew 25, 31 through, 40, uh, through 46. The goats and the sheep and the goats passage, that's what it's referring to, the judgment of the Gentiles at his second advent. Now, also... Since Daniel 7, 9, and 10 records events in symbolic terms which will take place at the end of Daniel's 70th week, the innumerable unidentified individuals that are rendering worshipful service to the Father and those standing around His throne waiting to do so must be both born-again, regenerate human, human beings and elect angels. Those who are regenerate human beings, when I say regenerate, I mean born-again, saved, they would include saved Israel, from Old Testament dispensations, including Daniel's 70th week, because remember, there'll be martyrs during the tribulation period. They're even spoken about in the book of Revelation. But also, these group of people, this innumerable amount of individuals worshiping the Ancient of Days and waiting to serve him, would also include 
born again Gentiles from every dispensation up to and including Daniel's 70th week. Lastly, it would also include us, the church, as well as elect angels. So we, because it's at the end of the tribulation period, this scene in Daniel 7, 9, and 10, we're in that number of people that will be around this throne when God goes, convenes the court. The father says, okay, you, my son, you can go back, take the earth, the jaws. You've, 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 you've won the victory, defeat him, defeat Satan, throw him into prison, get rid of this antichrist off the earth, start my kingdom on the earth and for a thousand years. We'll be there. Okay? So therefore, Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, does not describe the great white throne judgment of all unbelievers throughout human history recorded in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Why? Because this takes place, the great white throne judgment takes place after the millennial reign of Christ and Satan's final rebellion, which occurs just after the millennium. The events in Daniel 7, 9, and 10 take place immediately prior to the second advent of Christ, which terminates Daniel's 70th week. In fact, Revelation 19, verses 20 and 21, record Antichrist and the false prophet being thrown into the lake of fire. Then we see in Revelation 20, 1 through 4, Satan is in prison during the millennial reign of Christ. Then Revelation 20, 7 through 10, records the final rebellion of Satan, which takes place after the millennium, followed by Satan being cast into the lake of fire, where the Antichrist and the false prophet are still alive and suffering punishment. Then Revelation 20, 11 through 15, records the great white throne judgment in which every unsaved person in history is thrown alive into the eternal lake of fire. So the chronology of, of these events in Revelation 19 and 20 indicates quite clearly that Daniel 7, 9 and 10 records in symbolic terms the scene prior to the judgment of Antichrist at the end of Daniel's 70th week and prior to the second advent of Jesus Christ which brings to completion the times of the Gentiles. Obviously, the Antichrist is unsaved, and like every unsaved human being, exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but rejects it in unbelief, he will be thrown into the eternal lake of fire because of this rejection of Jesus Christ as his Savior. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with what we've heard. We pray that this would encourage us to know that you're in control and that you have a plan for this earth to establish your kingdom here on the earth through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the fact that we're going to be a part of that vast, innumerable amount of individuals that will be standing around your throne uh, just prior to the second advent of your Son, Jesus Christ. In fact, we'll be on the earth for a thousand years with your Son and worshiping Him and your Son, uh, Him, your Son, as well as yourself, Father, and the power of the Spirit. We thank you for this encouragement that you've given us in your word, and we pray it would be a blessing to the body of Christ and bring glory and honor to you and your Son. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.